say it's a little something that makes us sick. Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Feel bad. Okay, let's start with crazy. This is something new that you're doing that no one has seen you do like they've seen Man Thing in the front. There's okay. Uh, uh, now, what new things do you think you bring to the book? Okay, we're adding uh, a whole bunch of new features. One will be a regular six page feature called the Underground Almanac. Which is going to be the things that were good in the book. Work on, you know, and what I'm going to try and do is just improve on it so, you know, as best I can. The thing to do is steal comics books, one good feature, the barefoot. Hmm? Take barefoot from comics books, the one good feature. Now. I don't think I've read it. I, I don't. I haven't. Um, in fact, the funny thing is, I. I really just picked up my first issue of Mad in about four years, five years, the other day to look through it, and was pleased to find out that it's not any funnier than Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I really am. I, this is not to say that I don't think Crazy can be, be made quite a bit funnier. Well, you're uh, covering but, yourself uh, in case it can. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just happy to find out the competition isn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be, you know, really. Um, oh, trouble with up your nose. Know, uh, uh, Seattle like that coming. Mm. What? No, well, no, I'm serious about that. I, crazy can stand improvement here and there. I think Marv knew it, and I, you know, I know it. But uh, you know, again, I oh, I don't know. I'm not going to go into a tirade about other magazines, but I think it would be nice to do a funny humor magazine. Fresh. Be the first. It, yeah, really. I mean, you know, I've, the the one thing I do want to get away from with the with the book is uh, the fact that magazine humor has become very, very stereotyped over the past, well, since the inception of Mad, you know. They established a style uh, that was extremely funny when it began and remained funny and did, did well for them for about ten years, and um, they're still using it. And the book, you know, Mad has not basically changed over ten years. And crazy, as people have intimated, started out as a, you know, as a sort of mad imitation, grew from that very rapidly into something else. You know, within the first couple of issues, it, it began taking on its own identity. And what I would like to do with the book now is <clears throat> make as total a break as I possibly can with the old style of, of uh, magazine humor. You know, find something new to do. I'm not sure exactly what that means yet. You know, we're sort of searching around different directions and see what happens. You know, but I, I want this to be as different than. Uh, from Mad, ultimately, and from the Lamp, and from anything else being published, let's say the Firesign Theater is, uh, you know, different from a Fanny Fox record, you know, that kind of thing, you know, really. Okay, to get on to the color books. Uh, speaking of Man Thing, uh, how about expounding on your theory of color books as self therapy? As what? As self therapy? Some of the recent issues have been written uh, about subjects that have bothered me. The, the story about the fat kid um, in Giant Size Man Thing number four, wasn't it? I guess, yeah. Had a lot to do with my personal experience you know, growing up. The uh, Edmund's family experiences were all fictionalized. Uh, almost everything else was true. All, all of the school experiences, were, you know, things that came out of my own pants, except that I didn't die. That happened to another kid. <laughs> uh, that's true. It, that was that was based on an actual incident. And uh, uh, I, it's it's not so much therapy exactly. I guess it is in a way. It, it's a man. It's a means of getting outraged. The trouble is that when you let it become just therapy. Uh, it sometimes weakens the story an awful lot. I did not like the last chapter of that story, where Man Thing comes into the uh, the gym and basically tears everybody limb from limb. You know, uh, that that it, it came out as as pure revenge. You know, and uh, while I think maybe it, it had some dramatic and visual things, you know, that that made it good for the comic book medium, it was not a true ending, so to speak. You know, for that particular story, um, the true ending of this of the story probably should have been that absolutely nothing happened at all. Alice read the manuscript to the kids. They listened to it. They said, well, maybe we'll print it. We'll see. She went back to her locker, put it away, and that's the end of the story, and nothing happened. Uh, there was an alternate end to the story, uh, and 
that's what I did, you know, in the following. Speaking books, of that story, is, yeah, I like yeah. to that the point you just mentioned. She put the manuscript, as I remember, in her locker, and then they jumped her, right. and they didn't look in her locker, and they wanted the manuscript. They didn't know the combination of the locker. That's all. They didn't want to vandalize school property. Oh, they didn't they mind, would torture her. They didn't mind beating up the girl, but oh. they would not want to damage school property. Yeah, that was mm. actually what was going through my mind at that time. I felt that was a little extreme, too. I mean, you know, to be perfectly honest, uh, we talked about this before. The uh, the scene, the way I had written it originally, had her just on the floor of the gymnasium, uh, you know, surrounded and circled by, you know, Edmund's parents and, and the gym teacher and these other people. Um, I decided, you know, basically for visual impact, that it should be something a little stronger than that, having her hanging from those, uh, those gym rings. You know. um, I don't think that was exceptionally realistic any more than I think the rest of that last chapter was, was realistic. And uh, the next two issues of Man Thing, <coughs> in a sense, were an apology for the ending of that story, an apology to myself. I don't know what the readers are going to think of it. But, um, you know, the other thing that could have happened as a result of, of uh, Edmund's death was a severe reaction against the high school uh, for all the wrong reasons. You know? And that's what happened with the book burning. And, you know, the subsequent events, the, the death and, and rebirth of man thing in, in issues 17 and 18. And, you know, that's it, really. Uh, those books were written about things I was concerned about, but I don't, you know, I think it becomes a problem when they really become therapy. Well, it sort of seems that uh, you're doing the kind of stories where Denny O'Neill went wrong with Green Lantern and, and that he was saying this issue I'm going to be relevant and the next issue I'm going to, and it just seems as if you're not trying at it what do you mean but by it's happening by well I'm going to do a story that's that's relevant and it's not really going to be a comic book story that everyone will be able to you know the sort of story that they were attempting but they tried too hard and lost it a few of the final I, issues, I say, well, everyone expects me to be relevant. Just like everyone expects Steve Gerber to do strange stories you know, like I was that. Reading, I was reading an interview with Denny the other day where he said that the stories he felt didn't work were the ones that uh, You might as well put not, in a plug you know, for the competitive fan <laughs> magazine at this point. It's Amazing World of DC. And it's uh, you can fun, fun... I, I told Paul I would stick that in somewhere. <laughs> this All right, but anyway, the... Uh, the um, the stories Denny felt didn't work, were, uh, he said in this interview, were the stories that he didn't feel anything about in particular. He didn't. He, I, I don't know which stories that were, those were, um, but uh, I don't know. To a large extent, I feel the same way about Man Thing. I think the book has become something other than what the typical Marvel superhero book or monster book is. You know, if there is such a thing as a typical book. Um, it is. It's something different, you know. Whatever yeah. that is, and I think it has to be handled differently, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to her, I had him on tape elsewhere, and he was saying that books like Man Thing couldn't have been done, let's say, in Marvel six, seven years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. For one thing, we weren't publishing anything but superhero books six, or seven years yeah. ago. Um, for another thing, I mean, you know, I, those those kind of books, I don't think could have been done anywhere six or seven years ago. The world has changed dramatically since. Uh, well, we're really talking about 1960. I'm, I'm not even talking so. about anything to do with code, though. No, anything I'm not talking, I'm talking about, about the code about either. No. The Marvel style. The Marvel style is now diversified into different voices more than the. It is. It, it has the same basic premise, I think, in in every writer that you know the books should contain a certain amount of action. That uh, visuals are important. Uh, that character development is important. But, you know, when you have six or seven years ago, two people were writing all the Marvel books. Three, Gary Friedrich, uh, and Roy, and Stan, and that's it. Uh, there was bound to be more of a unified style at that time. Now we've got something like 12 different writers turning out books, and each one of them has, uh, I think, brought something of his own, you know, to the Marvel style. It's, there is still a very distinct and definite house style, you know, but it's, uh, you know, there are different permutations of it. It's, it's, uh, it's a little bit different the way everyone does it. You know. Jerry is probably closest, I think, to the original Marvel style. I think he'd agree with that, since he was brought in and trained, basically, by Ray and, uh, and Stan.
understand from very early days. Um, everyone since then has changed the style a little bit. Uh, Steve Englehart does something different. Don McGregor does something different. You know, it's uh, yeah. What can you say? That, that's you know. Um, I just be repeating myself the same thing, mm. uh, and I do something different. You know. Well, man, thing seems to have a progression. Which scale is good? Yes. Uh, All I'm saying it is. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the other the other aspect of that is, uh, you know, that that unified house style is fine when you're publishing 12 books. Uh, when you're putting out 30 or 40 new books a month, you know. All of them read exactly alike. It would be death. I mean, there's there's no way we, uh, you know, that that would help sell the books at all. You know, uh, the diversification, the fact that they they all are a little bit different, you know, uh, is probably what keeps the line as vital as it is. You know. Okay, one last question from Anthony. Uh, the entire series seems to be progressing. Uh, each issue, it's not just something that, uh, yeah. like for instance, something uh, Doug is planning on writing a, a final. Gabriel Devil Hunter story, because he felt that if he didn't, it would be uh, a bird. It wouldn't go in with the character. He'd have to change the character, make it something that isn't in order to continue it. So he's writing the final story. Mm -hmm. And do you have somewhere in your mind a final man thing story, no. which, a direction or a goal in which you're heading with the character? Or Richard Rory, just a supporting character. Oh, yeah. Something. Well, what's going on with Richard Rory over the next couple of issues is going to boggle several minds <laughs> out there, folks. Uh, I, I don't want to give it away. The whole thing will, will be, uh, you know, I mean, explained in issue uh, 19, I think. Uh, but that issue also, 19, is, is the start of like a five or six part serial for the book, which is something we haven't done for a long time. Korak uh, and Jennifer will be back in the, in the stories on a regular basis. Uh, possibly even the duck popping up here and there you know, for, for a panel or two. Uh, and you know, a whole basic, not not really a return to the weirdness, you know, of the early issues, but uh, something new built on that will be going on for the next, uh, you know, really five or six issues. Um, as for Richard Rory, yeah, I mean, that, that character is developing and changing, and there's a new character added to the book in the second half of the book burning story, which will be out by the time this is, uh, I guess... Know, published, so I can mention her. That's Olivia's daughter, Carol Selby. She will be a regular in the series, uh, and it's it's changing. You know, the relationship between them, I think, is probably going to be, a, if not a permanent thing, a longer lasting thing than anything he's had up to this point. You know, but under very very weird circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now speaking about okay. defenders, so we can get into talking about comics, comics. Yeah. Getting into, <laughs> rather, getting into the characters. Uh, what are you doing now that uh, Steve Englehart has acquired Yellow Jacket? What do you think of your oh, team members, things like that? Uh, Wondar and Nita have been nominated over and over again as a pair to join the Defenders. And it's very possible. I'm playing around with the idea. Um, nothing definite yet, but it's a good possibility. Uh, there have also been a lot of requests for Havoc. The, the mutant character from the X-Men, but I would suspect that he'll eventually be appearing again in the X-Men book, so you know, probably will not you know, come up in the Defenders. Um, Venus has been suggested several times, Bill Everett's character, and I, I wouldn't object to having a mythological character in, in the group. You know. um, or another woman. Uh, the, the other suggestion that has struck me as, as the most interesting is creating somebody brand new. The one suggestion has been a, a black female character, which I would like to do. Um, we've just done one, though, again, in the X-Men book, the new character Storm, you know, is uh, um, a black heroine. But uh, there are all kinds of possibilities. It's, it's still, as far as I'm concerned right now, just the basic four. Um, you know, Doc Strange, the Hulk, Valkyrie, and Nighthawk. And <coughs> the team won't grow to more than six. I like the idea of Nita because of her relationship to Submariner, who was, you know, originally one of the defenders. And um, I like Wondar basically because he's such a silly character, you know. And there's a lot of things that could be done with him. You know. 
within the context of that group. So um, they'll probably be popping up at least for a couple of issues to see how the readers like. Guest stars, uh, well, the Guardians of the Galaxy will be around for a couple of issues, and uh, starting in Giant Defenders number five, and then there'll probably be a, a two or three part series after that with the Defenders in the future battling the Badoon, and also involved in a, uh, you know, possibly individual stories within the, the major story, uh, possibly a sword and sorcery kind of thing with Valkyrie, and. Uh, an alien world mysticism story with Doctor Strange. You know, uh, that's one of the things that uh, that I've been playing around with is that nobody uh, knows whether the demons and, and deities that Doctor Strange calls on are confined necessarily just to Earth or to other planets. You know, uh, there may be other gods and other sectors of the, of the galaxy and the universe um, that Strange has no way of battling or, or you know, no no way of even knowing about. We have to assume that even the ancient one's knowledge was not infinite. And so uh, that's one basis for a story right there. Nighthawk, we'd get involved in a futuristic science fiction story, you know, and uh, the Hulk, you know, I don't know. But probably teaming each one of them up with one member of the Guardians, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then doing that for about, you know, two issues and then a climactic third issue, you know, uh, big battle with the Badoon, you know, that sort of thing. So, I'm, you know, that's. I'm planning right now. Then after that, a return to Earth and you know some more uh, business with Valkyrie and her husband, which is also becoming you know going to be a major subplot in the, uh, in the issues to come. Mm, uh, one of the things about super <coughs> teams when they were originally started, like say the Avengers of the Justice Society, they said, well, we'll do it like this. We'll take all these characters who are in their own books and who are fantastic, and we'll put them together, and how can we help but have this? marvelous team that, that could fight anything. Now, then people start to realize, hmm, if we have all these characters who are in their own books, we can't do anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, we can't have to do stories which don't affect the characterization right, right. created in their own book. Okay, we have so do you feel that's changing? <coughs> now we have sure, people, that, you know, like the X-Men, Fantastic Four. Uh, it, it, changed, uh, it changed with the Fantastic Four, basically. Uh, that was the first departure from it. The original Avengers was a return to the the first, you know, Justice Society, Justice League type format. Uh, the thing you have to remember is not that they got them together because now we have a team that can't, uh, you know, can never be defeated and can fight anything. They got them together because yeah, now we have a yeah. team that will sell, yes, you know, and sell very well. Uh, Stan realized the limitations of it early on with the Avengers, but then, you know, comic books had never been done. Uh, that way before, where, where the characters changed from issue to issue, uh, and where things happened to them. Uh, all the members of the Justice Society, uh, and the Justice League even now, uh, nothing basically ever changes in their original books, uh, so or their individual books, I mean. So you don't have that problem um, that, that you do with, with, say, the Avengers, when, when Thor and Iron Man and... Uh, you know, Ant-Man were, were the uh, major characters, and things were happening in their books all the time. Uh, I have that problem with Doctor Strange and the Hulk, and the best I can do is, is just sort of watch what's going on in those other books and talk to the writers of, of the other books and try and keep you know, consistent what we're doing. Um, I don't like it. I don't... Uh, I really have to admit, I don't like working with Doctor Strange and the Hulk within the context of the Defenders. They're both incredible characters, and uh, I enjoy using them when I do use them in the book, but at the same time, uh, it makes the book a lot more difficult to write, because I can't do anything with them that I want to do. You know? uh, very, you know, properly, Steve and, uh, and Len have, you know, control over what is happening to those individual characters. So the best I can do is sort of follow their lead, you know, and concentrate on the personal lives of Nighthawk and Valkyrie. Have you thought of making the Defenders an all non-appearing elsewhere member team? The theory is the book would not sell without Doctor Strange or the Hulk, or, or at least without the Hulk. Uh, 
and I can't see eliminating Doctor Strange and keeping the Hulk. Uh, somehow, I, the two are a pair in my mind. I don't know why. I see the two together uh, when I think of the Defenders. So, uh, one of the physical either, idiots, and yeah, right, the other one right, not doing yeah, anything yeah, physically. It's, it's, it's like gone. with Doctor Strange gone, there would be no one who could really control the Hulk, for one thing. Um, Nighthawk certainly couldn't, can't be reasoned with, um, and uh, Val just doesn't have the leadership potential at this point to be able to, you know, make her authority felt the way Doctor Strange does. So I, I see them as kind of a working, uh, you know, unit in the, in the team. And, uh, they both have to stay. If one stays, the other has to stay. It, it's like that. They both have to stay <laughs> down or de-orders, you know. Uh, and so I'm making the best of it. You know, I, I don't think they've been a detriment to the book at all. Um, at, not to my feeling. The, the one problem with it, of course, is the one that the readers have pointed up over and over again, is that Doctor Strange is not an action character. He doesn't work best dealing with physical menaces. Uh, and in fact, looking back over some of the stories, the, the really old Doctor Strange stories, the Ditko things, um, I found that he very rarely used his powers on, uh, or used his spells. He doesn't even really have powers. That's another question. Uh, on, uh, on physical entities. They were, they were mostly used against spiritual menaces of one kind or another. Uh, and so, it, it, to me, it, it's sort of it's jarring to see him knocking around the sons of the serpent with, you know, animated hoses and that sort of thing. But a large portion of the readership likes it. You know, as many as don't like it do like it. And uh, the letters I've seen uh, also, which is most of them, I read all the mail, um, is... Uh, the letters I've seen have been violently opposed to getting rid of the Hulk, too. So, they stay. Mm. I think that's it. Unless you have any other books up your sleeves, I don't know. No, nothing. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> any statement you want to make in general to the assembled uh, fans, which we did before, you know, in this little box, hiding. Buy Man Thing, please. <laughs> it's a very good book. Um, and uh, that's that's about it. Yeah. Okay. 